Hey, hope you're having an awesome start to your week today. We're going to have a lot of fun. So today we're going to be talking about music theory. We're going to be talking about music theory like as if we're using a voodoo doll. <laughs> How to use music theory like a voodoo doll. And I thought, who should I bring in to talk about this topic? Well, as you can imagine, there's really only one guy. Right? There's, there's really only one man who needs no introduction, but I'll give you an introduction anyway. Dr. Tommaso Zilio. Hello, Dr. Zilio. How are you doing today? Hey, welcome, Les. How is it going? Going fantastic. Great to have you here. Before we get started, for everyone watching us live here, let us know who you are and where you're watching from. I see that Lars is here and Johan, uh, Fireman74 from Hungary. Uh, Roberto Castro, hello, everybody. All right, so the, you guys just let us know where you're from. Also, as we talk today, you probably will have questions along the way. That's great. Let us know in chat what sorts of questions you have for the doctor or for myself, but I think uh, Dr. Zito will probably be doing most of the talking here today on this particular topic. So let us know in chat as we move on questions related to what we're talking about so if you have questions about sweet picking or something like that that's not <laughs> ask those questions another time when we're talking about sweet picking all right so doctor if you were talking about voodoo my title is witch doctor <laughs> which do which doctor yes which doctor all right which doctor zilio so how can how do composers or how can one use music theory music theory ideas concepts whether it's songwriting or or improvising or whatever to make the listener feel whatever you the composer the player the songwriter wants them to feel by using the music theory knowledge that you have effectively uh of course, I'm metaphorically speaking here when we talk about you know voodoo dolls, but it's a kind of a good visual picture of being able to transmit the the emotional response that you're hoping to get when you're playing, writing, improvising, etc. To get the get that emotional response you're hoping for. Well, that's what music theory is about. Indeed, if there was no way to use music theory to do that so to know how what you're playing what you're composing will sound to the ear of the listener there would be no point to music theory at all <laughs> that, that's why music theory exists the only real reason okay everything else they they, they told you that music theory tells you if a piece is good or not that it tells you what other composers are doing, yeah, up to a certain point, etc. It's secondary, and even invented later sometimes. I mean, it's not the original, not the original purpose. The original purpose was we want to make music. We don't want to make music blindly. We want to know how people are going to feel when we play it, when we give the music to them. Okay. Imagine for just a moment. That you're a musician in one of the courts in the courts in Europe in the 1700s. Okay, you're a musician. A prince or a duke hired you, and your job is to go in, sit at the keyboard, whatever keyboard the instrument is. Okay, could be a harpsichord, could be an organ, later could be a piano, and you have to provide ent entertainment for the whole hour. And now people want to dance. You need to know that what you're playing is danceable, okay? You need to respect the mood of the evening. You want happy or sad or whatever, depending on the evening. You cannot afford, when everybody's happy, to play a funeral march. You can't. <laughs> They're going to fire you or worse, okay? So it, it's born, this whole idea of theory is born from a very pressing and practical need, okay? And now I'm going into the 1700s right now as an example. But music in any era has been that, okay? If you were a troubadour in the Middle Ages, if you were a musician in ancient Greece or Rome, you go in, you play music, that's your trade, you can't afford to play the wrong thing, okay? They're not going to call you back for the next gig, or they're going to feed you to the lions, one way or the other, okay? So, 
Okay, so that's why it exists. Everything else comes later. <laughs> okay, of course, the more we evolve in time, and especially with the 19th and 20th century, the music became way, way, way more complex. And so now we have a lot of theory, which people think it's a disadvantage, like it's too complex, it's too much to learn. No, it's just you can do more thing with it. You can pinpoint the emotion more exactly. You can create a wider range of emotions. And so there is more to learn. <laughs> I mean, if you can do more things with it, it takes more time to learn. No more, no less. Okay, so. And it all works uh, with association. So you think, <clears throat> this idea, this concept, I'm going to make examples in a moment, guys. I'm just introducing it right now, okay? But this idea, this concept, this chord produces this feeling. And if you take those two ideas and you put them together, it produces this other feeling. And it's kind of like cooking, okay? If you add salt, you add a specific flavor. If you add pepper, you add a specific flavor. If you cook it more or less, you change the flavor, and then you just adju you adjust those elements to get what you want. Okay, which also means, and that's a very important point that I don't want you guys to forget, just like cooking, you have to do things to your taste. So just reading the music theory book is just like reading a cooking book. You learn nothing until you do. And when you do, you modify the recipe to what you like. Okay, I don't think I've ever followed a recipe <clears throat> in cooking exactly as written in the book i've tried but <laughs> I, I every time it's like nope that's too much salt let's put less okay or stuff like that is there anything strange in that no so is there anything strange when people teach you music theory and you go like no i actually like this in a different way great it means you're thinking <laughs> okay so i'm making examples today you may like them you may not like them you may think if i change this little thing it works best for me Great. Do it. Okay. Those are all starting points. Okay. But it's good to have the starting points too. So imagine a more modern situation. They hire you to write the soundtrack for a movie. Maybe not a full movie. That, that would be a hard uh, gig to land. But maybe they're asking somebody is making a 10 minute video and they want a soundtrack. And the video has a specific mood. Okay. It could be horror movie. Okay. It could be. Mm, a mystery video. It could be an instructional video, so it could not be a fi fiction, it could be non-fiction. You need to provide something relevant to that. You can't really, I mean, maybe it's the, it's the first time, maybe if you're a hobbyist, you can afford to do a lot of trial and error, but otherwise, if you're a professional, you really cannot afford to spend hours and hours and hours trying to find the right thing. So there are some go-to association that you learn, okay? And nobody tells you those. Well, of course, few people tell you those and sparse and far in between. So you need to work on that sometimes on your own. Grab a, I mean, that's my binder. Only for composition. <laughs> okay. It's kind of thick and it's going to get thicker. Okay. So whenever I find a, a trick, an idea or something like, hey, if I play this chord, this sounds this way. If I play this, the trick it sounds this way, it ends in there. That's why it's exactly here. Okay, because I don't want to go around the room and, and, and search for it. Okay, when I want to compose something, I reopen that. I go on the page, I don't know, for fear or the page for terror or the page for beauty or the page for something else. And I read what I wrote and I have a starting point. And then from there, I build up my thing. Okay, so. Before, sorry, before you continue, I want everybody to realize... <laughs> the unbelievably massive amount of gold that just came out of the doctor's mouth. He has a binder with compositional concepts as, as and, and correct me if I got this wrong, uh, Tommaso, but the concepts, at least the ones you referred to, help you to recall or remember ways of expressing certain concepts or ideas. It's not like, oh, look, here are the uh, counterpoint rules from, you know, the 17th century. It's not, it's not that sort of stuff. I mean, maybe you have that sort of stuff in there too, but it, it's, here's what I'm looking to express. Here are ways, concepts, maybe examples, things I've done in the past, things I've learned, things I've created, things I've developed 
where I can go like a reference guide. I can go right there and say, oh, here are 47 ways that I can create this. And maybe you'll use one of those. Maybe you'll use two or three in combination. Maybe you use 10. Maybe you'll decide, you know, I'm going to look for something different today. But you have it, you're not looking at a blank canvas, you know, a blank sheet of paper and wondering, I don't know, where do I start? I don't let me grab my guitar and just start goofing around for 47 hours until I stumble upon something that kind of sounds cool. Not that there's anything wrong with that approach, except of the 47 hours of waste. <laughs> but it's a it's a super massive um shortcut in a sense. So there's a lot of work that has to happen up front. You have to gather your ideas, learn your ideas, develop new ones, combine them together, write them down, sort them some way, and then you could quickly go and you can reference them. I have something very similar. It's on my computer. Um, very similar for, for writing. So I wanted to make sure that people caught that and didn't, you know, just hear it and then move on, you know, waiting for you to say the next thing, because that, that is an absolute goldmine. So that is all. Yes. And uh, like you were saying, this is for compositional ideas. This is not theory or orchestration or other stuff. It's compositional ideas. For instance, I have another notebook here that has been used for theory. Okay. That's, that's basic, the basic harmony. What would be the first theory in a, in a university? Okay. I have my notebook on orchestration. On the other table, etc. So, this is not all theory. It's just compositional ideas. <laughs> okay. I actually like to keep those things separate. <laughs> okay. So, so when I search for something, I know where to go. Okay. That I have the, the the notebook on counterpoint, which has been done once and then completely forgotten because the way the way they teach you counterpoint is the wrong way to teach counterpoint. But we're gonna talk about this another time, I guess. No. So. Right now we talk about compositional ideas and the voodoo doll idea. So let me say one thing. There is no reason, as far as we know, why any combination of sound should give feeling to people. Okay. I mean, probably there is, but we haven't the faintest. They have been trying to study these. It, it, it's, it's 150 years they're trying to study this scientifically. We can't get an idea on why. We have, we have some hypotheses, you know, like, I mean, yeah, uh, intervals of the, the, with the frequency relationship uh, are, are simple, sim are more relaxed intervals than uh, stuff where we have less simple relationship. It's all vague from the scientific point of view. So if you guys ask me why, the answer is, I haven't the faintest, and indeed, nobody has the faintest, okay? And I researched the topic quite a while. So that's the first thing. All of these is empirical. Like, we play these, people feel that way, we, not, we notice that, we record it, okay? There is no underlying grand scheme of thing yet, okay? So, there are some principles. Okay, the more dissonance you put into your chords, in general, the less at ease the whole thing sounds. So you can, you can make some, some principle. For instance, if normal chords, normal triads are built by uh, stuck in thirds. So I have, I don't know, the C note, the note on top of it is the E, so a third above, the note on top of it is the G, so a third above. If I want a seventh, I'm going, I could a third above and so on and so forth. And then I can rearrange the order of those notes. But you can build chords in other ways. One, th one thing we found is that if you build the chords in fifths, not in thirds, you obtain a certain kind of uh, terse and transparent beauty out of those chords. So if you do this instead. By and large, everybody describes this as a beautiful chord, as opposed to a chord that expresses fear or a chord that expresses sadness or a chord that expresses something else. That sounds as beauty. Okay, I get you may have different association than me. 
you, you can find another context and situation where this is not beauty, but by and large, this by itself in isolation is beauty. And I can go and keep building. So I have a C, a fifth above I have a G, a fifth above I have a D. I can go another fifth up, and after the fifth above the D, I will have an A. And it's still beautiful. Okay. It has to become hard to have more to have more notes on the guitar, but you could try to get this, this E on top. Okay. So the fifth is this kind of empty interval. It sounds hollow. Again, those are all metaphors, okay, guys? If you want to use a different word, use a different word. But respect to the no, a third, which sounds thick, or a sixth, the fifth tends to sound hollow, empty, okay? Kind of a, it's less thick, okay? But if you stack it, you get this kind of ethereal beauty. Okay, that's the fifth in pure form. But I can do the I can I can take one of the normal chords I have, like C major. I'm playing C G C E, so I'm playing a C major chord, and try to do the same game here. So I play now C G D and the E note. So it's half a chord made of fifths and half chord made of thirds, because this will be C, E, and G. And if I mix those two things, I get this, which is less ethereal, less abstract than just the fifths, but still beautiful. That's a C add nine chord. Now, they teach you what a C add nine chord is. Okay, you go on YouTube, search C at nine. I mean, don't don't do that. Why would you do that? I mean, but if you go on YouTube and search for the C at nine chord is, you're gonna find people telling you that hey, it's just a C major chord in which you add the D. Oh, it's a beautiful chord. What they don't tell you is that uh, this chord literally expresses beauty in every kind of um, song soundtrack situation where this has been played in any, in any symphony or other stuff, yeah, use this chord to express beauty. That's the association. You can ask me, is, does this happen because there is uh, this kind of sound biologically produces this in your brain, or it's because everybody uses this chord to express that and we made the association and nobody knows? Okay. But if you want to express beauty, that's one of the chords. Okay. Now, it's hard to do a song with one chord. But you can play this chord. We can do a... You can play this chord. For instance, in this way, and in C major, I'm playing a C at 9, an F at 9, a G at 9, and a C at 9. Okay. So, and since somebody asked, yes, the ninth interval is taken from the root. So the D is the ninth. The thing you need to remember is that the, the ninth, they teach you that the D is the ninth. Great. But if you build a chord, the D is the fifth of the fifth. And you have to remember that. Because otherwise it, it, it doesn't explain why the ninth sounds so nice. And it's because it's built as a stack of fifths and the fifths sound nice. Okay. Those are all little considerations when we do all these things. Okay. In general, that's the idea. Now, you have something to say to me? Yes, yeah, just, yes, exactly. I wanted to make one little clarifying, not that you didn't answer, you did. But on this question here, um, Ron, the answer, which Tommaso already gave, is yes, it's taken from the root. 
uh, but we want to make the distinction that it's taken from the root of that chord. So when Tommaso went from C add nine to F add nine, the ninth for the F add nine is in relation to the root of that chord, not in relation to the root of the key. So it's not like taking an F chord and adding the D note on top. That would be something different. So what Tommaso did was take the F chord and add the ninth of that chord, which would be G on top, still stacking the fifths. Yeah, so I just wanted to just, um, you know, mention that point because someone could, not necessarily Ron, but someone else could mi misunderstand thinking you take the ninth of the key, you add it to all these chords, and you have had nine, nine chords, and well, no, but that would only work on the one chord. Yeah. I mean, what you're saying right now, it's doable, it's just another thing. Right, it would not, correct, it's something else, exactly. Okay, That's a, that will be a pedal point. Okay, and just since we are here, <laughs> let's see how that sounds. So if I just take, let's say I'm in the key of C, the ninth or the second, it's the D note. And I could play C, G, D, so, sorry, C. That's why that was one. That's C, F, G, C. The one, four, five in the key of C major. And I can put the D note on top of all the chords. So on the first chord, I still get this C and nine. And I get this F with a D on top, which is an F sixth, or a D minor seven flat, uh, D minor seven uh, in an, some, some inversion. Then I have the G, and the G contains the D note, so. And then I go back here. It works, no? But that's not beauty in the sense we had before okay these could be wistful afternoon um, with wistful sunny afternoon okay and uh, somebody riding a bicycle toward the park okay uh, this kind of trick of let's do a pedal point on top with all those happy major chords uh, it's what you hear a lot in advertisement you know I'm thinking, uh, I'm thinking, especially the advertisement on YouTube, like uh, Grammarly or stuff like that. <laughs> okay, I don't want to advertise anything right now, but they open and they give you this happy music and there is always a pedal point in there. <laughs> okay, um, It's a trick. It makes for very catchy jingles for, um, for those kind of for apps, if you want, or stuff like that. Uh, we could do a whole reasoning on why this happens okay but it's it's another instance of manipulation if you want like those people know that if you do if you if you if you play the happy chord plus pedal point you get something that is suited for these kind of um, apps um, it, it gives the idea of something easy it gives the idea of something that makes you happy and it gives the idea of something that eliminates all the problems of your life okay gives a solution okay in other words Voodoo. Yes. <laughs> right. See, it's um, it gives the idea of something simple and magic, if you want, but not magic in the mystical sense, magic in the easy sense. Okay. If you have to write a jingle for a commercial, play a one for five or in general happy chords, avoid the minor chords, stay in key, a major key, and put a pedal point somewhere. Put, an in, put, a, put a very put a springy rhythm on it, okay? Or something. Mm, I mean, don't go for a slow. That's not the right feeling. You want a you want a kind of a fast air tempo, okay? And kind of a um, the thing you want, want make the thing moving. And the arrangement will it's always with uh, instruments that have a sharp attack, okay? So like percussions. Uh, or um, pizzicato strings, or stuff that has a sharp attack and a short decay time, okay? It's because it gives kind of the, the idea of being um, sharp and fine, and, but not, not edgy, okay? But wistful, okay? Wistful would be the, <laughs> the word for it, okay? Anyway, so we can get down to the recipe, okay? We can get down for, for any, any of those things. We can get down to the recipe, okay? How do I know this stuff? Well, like you, I was subjected to a lot of advertisement. Only rather than being there and thinking and thinking, do I want to buy Grammarly or not? I'm thinking, 
what are they doing here? <laughs> okay. And I'm taking notes and transcribing the jingle, okay? And then writing it down. And you can do this too. Thomas. Yes, this that's exactly why you read my mind. That's exactly why I came back on the camera right now because I wanted to point out that for everybody watching and listening, okay, I know that some of you are thinking, okay, Dr. Z is talking. We got a really smart guy with a brain that huge. So, of course, he knows why all this stuff works and how it works. Well, you could take that approach. He is a very smart guy. But you could also just listen to what he just said, which is, how does he know this stuff? Advertisement comes on. He asks a question. What's going on here? First, what are they doing? They're selling something. What are they trying to do? How are they trying to influence the viewer, the listener? And then what to take what action to feel what way? Okay. And then what are they back up? When you're selling something, anything, helping the person you're selling to feel a certain way, be in a certain frame of mind makes a big difference of whether they buy or they don't buy. OK, so now you don't have to know anything about selling or marketing or advertising to know that. But from a musician's point of view, you want to understand why is the music there sounding this way? Because they're trying to put the people in a certain frame of mind. They're trying to move their emotions this way so that the ad that's going on can help influence them to buy. So the person who wrote the music, who understands all of this is creating music to try to put people's mental state over here in an optimal place to sell them to. So when you're writing your songs, when, you, when you're listening to anything, just ask, what is meant to be done here? If you're watching a, a horror film, how does the music function there to set you up to prepare to scare you or make you feel nervous or uneasy? If you're watching a dramatic film, uh, if you're watching, uh, yeah, any sort of drama and there's distress there, how is the composer bringing the, the viewer, the listener's mind into that place so that the story has so much more impact? Take any movie, watch any movie, mute the sound, no music, and see if you're nervous, scared, excited, laughing, its impact is so much less. People don't realize how powerful the music and the sounds going on are to, to multiply the emotional response that people have when they're watching or viewing something. So you simply ask the question, what, what is the songwriter or the composer's intention? What do they intend to do here? What's the purpose here? And then how are they using music, musical ideas, compositional ideas? To create, though, if you just even if you don't know the answer, if you're thinking I I don't know how to answer that question, you know what? Asking the question puts you ninety percent of the way there because most people are never going to answer that ask the question, and so for sure they're not going to find the answer. Ask the question, you're ninety percent of the way there. That's all I yep. wanted to say. Yep, yep. And the question is, I'm listening to these. I feel this way. Why do I feel this way? What makes me, I mean, it could be the chords, it could be the chord progression, it could be the, in, the volume of the sound, it could be the timbre of the sound, it could be the combination of the timbers of the sound, it could be the tempo, it could be the, the rhythm, it could be a different, different thing. It's not always the chord, okay? Um, we have a very good theory about chords, and so we often talk about chords, but sometimes it's not a chord, okay? Sometimes, sometimes they play one note, and, and that's enough if it's played with the right instrument, with the right intensity, and at the right moment, okay? So that's, that's the thing. You just listen to thing and ask why. And you guys can do this anytime you, you listen to the radio, you listen, you watch TV, okay, you go to the cinema, you are in a supermarket and there is music uh, on, on the loudspeakers. Everywhere there is music. You can listen to that, okay? So, now, if simple intervals stacked on top give you beauty, not so simple intervals stacked on top or mismatching the intervals gives you 
anise. Okay, and the specific kind of anise depends on, on, on how you mismatch the whole thing. So, for instance, one staple of uh, mystery movies, okay, so imagine the scene. You have your detective, okay, which is investigating a murder, and your detective is kind of going back to the scene of crime during the night with no, with no support, with no, with, no, with no backup, because he's an idiot, or because the guy who's writing the movie is an idiot, because the, but the scene always happens. No? And they go back, and there is the, the murderer somewhere behind a corner, a, a, a corner with a knife. And you're going to hear this chord every single time. Together with this chord, you're probably going to hear a bass clarinet playing a descending line. Okay, <laughs> something like that. It's a cliche. Okay. Indeed, uh, indeed, they introduce the the bass clarinet in, Mo in in Hollywood orchestras precisely to give the same. Okay. You guys don't get me started on the bass clarinet because then we stay here one hour on how such such a wonderful instrument that is. Okay, but I don't think most people are that interested in that. Anyway, what is this chord? It's a minor major seventh. Okay, so I'm playing the notes A, C, E, and G sharp. I can play them in many ways. That's probably a more common inversion. Oh, I see. Okay. This G sharp and the A have a major seventh of distance. And so A G sharp is a major seven. But the G sharp conflicts with the minor third of the chord, which is C, because they are a triton apart. No, sorry, they're not a triton apart. They are, um, sorry, C G sharp is not a triton apart. It's um, an augmented fifth apart. Okay. Not only that, but if you eliminate the bass and you think only at the top three notes, you have C, E, G sharp, and that's an augmented chord. Okay. Augmented chords sound unsettling. L let's stay for a moment only on the augmented chord, and then we recover the A. Augmented chord sounds unsettling. Why? Because they are perfectly symmetric. They divide the octave in three. Okay, there are 12 notes in the octave. If you jump four notes every time on the chromatic scale, you get a augmented chord, C, E, G sharp. This chord is the same chord even if I put the E at the base or the G sharp at the base. The shape is the same, the intervals are the same. What does it mean? It means that not one of those notes is the real root of the chord, because any one of those could be the real root of the chord. The chord is perfectly symmetric. Your brain is trying is hearing this sound and turning those notes around and trying to think and trying to go and like, which one is the root? Which one is the root? For some reason, your ear needs to find the root of anything. Okay. There is a very good reason, but we don't want to stay here hours and hours explaining information theory. But there is a reason. Your ear, whenever you play a, a chord, your ear immediately goes like, that's the root, and all the other notes are interpreted over the root. If you get a symmetric chord, like an augmented chord, your ear cannot do that, and its experience is a feeling of uncertainty. Why? Because your ear is not certain. <laughs> it's like, what do I do with that? Where am I going from here? <laughs> okay, the mess? Yeah, I wanted to say that even non-musicians who know nothing about music or nothing about music theory, their brain does the same thing. See, brains want to, they seek out patterns and there's, it's seeking hierarchy. And that's what searching for the root does. If you, if your brain can d determine where the root is, and again, even a non-musician who doesn't even know what a root means, their brain is still trying to do that. They're trying to establish what is the relationship, the hierarchy, between the notes. But in the symmetrical chord, which uh, Dr. Zito just described, there isn't one because we can't determine which of the notes is the root because simultaneously, any one of them could be the root because the relationship between all the notes, the intervals are the same. Exactly. So you have these chord. Now this chord though, as a prop, I mean, it works. Eh? but it has a major third. 
why do I say but? Because a major third, it's it's what we call a positive interval, okay? A major interval, that's what we call them, okay? And so, up to here, sounds nice. It's just this note setting the whole thing, or all thing in a strange way. To make it worse, you want to eliminate the major third one way or another. And so what you do is you change the bass, so you put a bass of A, so if you had a bass of C, C is the root, E is the major third, G is the sharp five. But if you put a bass of A, now all the notes change feeling, because now you make clear that A is the root, so now C is a minor third, E is a fairly neutral fifth, perfect fifth, and the seventh is a major seventh. So you get all the unsettling feeling of the Dvini, of the augmented chord, plus the sense of danger from the minor third. Now, of course, one chord is not enough, right? I mean, you, you can try to milk this chord. Maybe play inversions, okay, like, or, or voicings like that. And so some, sometimes that's enough. But that may not be an, enough if the scene is longer a center. So, you move this thing. And you move it around by holding the same shape and moving it around by a certain number of frets up and down. If you move it by four frets up and down, you get this interesting thing that the top chord are always the same three notes, but the, the bass changes. So it's, the top chord doesn't really move, but the bottom moves and it gives you the idea of a progression of going somewhere. Okay? Again, you have to hear it. <laughs> That's the thing. You, you could not tell these a priori, unless you knew it already. You kind of sense like the danger is coming closer, no? Okay. Or, you can move these by two frets every time. So, now it's different. Now it moves in a different way. But before it was like a kind of a, a linear relation, like this is getting closer, getting closer, getting closer, okay? These, the danger just comes from another direction in a sense. It's getting closer too, but not in a linear way, not directly. It's not making a beeline for you, okay? The danger is changing and, and coming from another direction, then from another direction. So this is suited. So you have to do the two chord progression. The first one is suited when you want to express that there is a guy with a knife about to kill the protagonist. And you see them getting closer and closer and closer and closer and closer. And, closer and you want to express like, um, immediate danger uh, with no possibility of escaping. Maybe they escape, but it's like, that's what they're expressing right now. On the other hand, if there is a chase and maybe, and maybe the protagonist realizes something is amiss, you want to use the other progression. Because now the protagonist is changing, going somewhere else. So the other guys have to follow the, the, the protagonist and, and chase him. And so there's a whole chase going on. I mean, very low key, and it's not a car chase. And you can move up and down. Right. So you, have all, you just take every other fret, and you can move freely on those frets. And it will give you this kind of feeling. Okay. Could you move in different ways? Yes, you could move every fret. But do a kind of a different feeling again, and or you could move every three frets. That gives an even different feeling. 
okay? What you find is that if you catalog those feelings and you try to find all the movie scenes where they use this and try to see where they use specific progression, there are different situations to which those progression are suited, <laughs> okay? And again, it's partly going and chasing everything, all, all the music you can and transcribing it, and partly it's sitting down and thinking, I am feeling this way. Why am I feeling this way? And sometimes you need to do some experiments because, I mean, it's, if it's not, the chord is the same. So it's not just the chord. The progression comes into it. And you need to play the progression and, and see, okay, this progression makes me feel this way. These other progression, progression make me feel this way, and so on and so forth. The hard thing here is that the, when you do this at the beginning, you have no idea. So the, the beginning is a bit slow. Okay. But I mean, I'm already telling you that the minor seven, the minor major seven, sorry, is the danger chord, or one of the danger chords, already gives you a lot to get started. Make sense? Uh, I have, there's an interesting question there about voice leading, Thomas. I'd like to answer that. Which is, does voice leading an answer alter the perception of emotion in a chord progression? Oh, yes. Now, I'm going to make this very general statement. It's a very general statement. It's a basic principle, and you're going to find a lot of exceptions to it because, like every basic principle, you can negate the effect by doing other things. So when, when I say it, don't, go, don't immediately write in the comment, but I know a counterexample. Yeah, I know. Okay? But by and large, whenever the, whenever the pitch moves up, it is perceived as a positive feeling. Whenever the pitch moves down, it is perceived as a negative feeling. And if the pitch moves up slowly, it is perceived in a mild negative feeling or a negative feeling stretched in time. When the neg uh, sorry, when it moves up, it's a mild positive feeling or stretched in time. If it moves up very fast, it's perceived as a very positive feeling and an acute, immediate positive feeling. Same for the negative direction. If it moves down slow, or if it moves down really fast. If you want to express death you move down very fast. Okay. Okay. If you want to express despair, despair is not immediate. Despair is a long way down toward death. Okay. So you move down slowly. Now, in voice leading, you connect the chords. You can connect the chords going up and you can connect the chords going down. Okay. If you go up, you enhance the positive feeling, or you temper the negative feeling by moving up, and vice versa. Okay? This is one element among many. So, of course, if, if you move up, but everything else points toward the negative, so you're in a minor key, you use minor chords, um, you use specific dark timbers in your instrument, you, your dynamic is going down slowly, even if you're moving up in pitch, that's not enough to say that the whole thing is positive because everything else weighs on it. Okay, so you need to take this as a principle, not as always perfectly right all the time and then the only element. There are many elements. That's the beauty of it. You can have one element going up and one element going down and express any kind of mixed feeling. Thomas? Maybe you have some, an example? Yep. Okay, okay sure. If you want to express uh, despair or lament, okay, I'm using this word specifically because this is called the, the lament chord progression, okay, or the lament bass. Let's say you are in the, in, in, first of all, I mean, it's, we do this in a minor key, obviously, okay, I mean, it's, you wouldn't express despair in a major key, okay. I'm sure you can find a way, but no, it's not typical. So let's say we are in a minor key, okay. And I'm in C minor right now. And so what I'm thinking is that I'm going to move down and slowly. And what's the slowest way to move down? And I go move, move down from the root, of, from the tonic of the chord C down to the fifth of the chord. 
Why? Because at the fifth, I want to hit the fifth chord, the dominant chord, and then maybe resolve to the one or go somewhere else at the center. But the, the stereotypical things goes from the root of the chord, the, the, the root of the, the key to the fifth of the key, and then. There are a few chord progression you can put on top. That's a typical one. And that's your despair. You've heard this. <laughs> it's not new. It's good progression. It's 300 years old. <laughs> okay. How about playing, maybe playing those chords without the descending bass line with, with different voice leading or maybe no care to voice leading at all to, to maybe show how the same chords essentially voice differently, not with the descending bass line. How, how that changes the effect. That would be interesting to do because the, 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 the line is so strong, I suspect they're going to hear it anyway. But let's see. Uh, okay, let me see because let me recalculate the whole thing. <laughs> That's a curveball you're throwing me. <laughs> okay, so this, but well, I could play this that way. Yeah. So. It's so hard to play this in a Without, without, without the um, correct voice leading. Okay, for instance, this chord sounds way more positive already. Um, um, so, let me turn. Yeah, it loses a bit of the effect, you see, when I, when I jump around. I, th I think the ear still kind of puts that in there. It is so typical, so cliche, if you want. So it's been playing so much in the history of music. And by the way, it still sounds good. and It still sounds fresh. That's the beauty of it that you hear that descending line anyway. But if you, if you want to hear the difference between resolving up and down, for, for instance, or moving up and down, that's easy. If I take the last, uh, that's a five, to G7 to C minor, five to one. But I can also go this way. And it's still a five to one, but another voice voices move up. And you hear a difference. I mean, these, Done. I put it to death. <laughs> or it's going up. Even if I'm always ending on the on, on, on a tonic, not on the melody, it's moving up. It leaves some um, some doors open to hope. Okay. <laughs> for lack of a better description, okay? So, and it's, it's the same chords, same chords, okay? So, if you can arrange things that move up or down, you can change the feeling of the chord progression. I can you change it completely? No, I mean, it's still a 5 to 1 in minor, okay? It's still not going to be a happy ending, but it's going to be a different kind of a sad ending. Now, the chord... The, the lament chord progression it's so it's so engineered for the descending bass that it's quite hard to re-engineer it for an ascending bass because it's kind of optimized for this voice leaning okay it's just too evident and just too evident and then you, to, to break it you would have to break the voice leading in in ways that make it feel disconnected. Like I was when I was playing the other version, it's like, mm, that's the wrong chord. It, it breaks the whole thing. 
Okay. But the starting point was not the chord progression. The starting point was a descending bass line. And then we fashion the chord on top to make that work. That's the idea. Okay. So, and again, this is, the, this is the very simple consideration that when you go down, it feels negative, and when you go up, it feels positive. Okay. This is such a simple point, but you will not find anybody around saying this as clearly. Because since it is one element among many, you can always find an example of sad music that goes up and it's still sad. Or positive music, happy music that goes down, but it's still happy. Okay, but it is an element, it's important, and it works that, that way. Period. Okay. There, there is really, I mean, it's a, in any situation where you have sad music with the lines going up that manages to still be sad, if you rewrite that, that piece with the lines going down, it's more sad, not less. Okay. So everything else being the same, changing from up, lines going up to lines going down makes everything sadder and vice versa. Okay, now, this is part of a big field of study called the semantic of music. You know when people, people you say something and people want to dismiss you and they tell you semantics as, as a, they want to dismiss you? That means they have no idea what semantic means, because semantic means how do we associate a symbol to a, to a meaning? How do we associate, for instance, chords or lines or situations in music to a meaning? That's what semantic is, okay? <laughs> People that tell me that's just semantic, I'm like, yes, that's exactly what it is. And it's important. <laughs> okay. You, you're my kind of making my point. Okay. People don't talk anymore about the semantic of music. You take any music to the book and they don't talk about that. They just don't. They, they, they get at most at like, yeah, my major sound happy, minor sound sad, give or take. Okay. But they don't talk about that. Okay. But it's the most important thing. It is the most important thing. It, some people here have took my course on modes. They know that in session two, I talk about the order of brightness, which is a specific way to organize the mode. That's a, that's a semantic way to organize the mode. You go up in that order, it's happier. You go down in the order, it's sadder or brighter and darker. Okay. That's why I made it one of the center point of the whole course. Okay. So you know what those modes mean when you play them. Okay. But there's plenty of gestures like that. When you go up, it sounds this way. When you go down, it sounds this way. When you go, when you move faster, it sounds more positive. When you move slower, it sounds more negative. If I'm playing the lament, typically I will go slowing down. So we start. I, I played it wrong now, of course. <laughs> And it goes slowing down. That's what accentuates the negative feeling. If I were do, was doing the opposite, that's not as despairing anymore because I'm, I'm, I was accelerating. Same for dynamic, moving up, moving down. <laughs> Same for a number of other things. Okay, so all those elements come together. Okay, so you can even even if we don't think about harmony, if we think only about everything else, you can manipulate manipulate people and their emotion just by dynamics or the timber of the sound or the timber or all the or the speed. Okay, or the tempo essentially or. All, all those things. You have something to say. I can see you have something to say. Yeah, I wanted to basically, um, basically just say that for everyone who's listening here, when you listen to music, your favorite songs, when you listen to movies in particular, you, you, you'll learn so much more listening to, me, to music and movies because it's obvious to you, or should be obvious, what is trying to be expressed. This, sometimes less obvious when you don't know what the intention of the songwriter was, particularly if uh, we're dealing with instrumental music. But my point is here that when you're listening to music, 
Um, pay attention to not just what is the chords or what is the key or what motor scale are they using, but what are all of the different elements that you can notice? And if you don't notice them all, that's okay. But you get in the practice of the habit of thinking about every single thing. How does the pitch range work? Is it is exactly as the doctor was talking about? Are things going higher in pitch, lower in pitch? You know, the rhythm, the tempo, the, the texture, how, how, how are instruments layered on top of each other? There's more than just simply chord progressions and, and melody in the key. So all of those things are working together. And the better the composer is, the more likely those things are to be working together. And when they don't, when they don't all work congruently, it's being done for a reason. There's a, there's a conscious choice. It's not random. It's not just whatever. Okay. If you're listening to an amateur, it might be whatever. But if you're listening to, you know, John Williams, who writes the Star Wars music, for example, every single aspect there is done intentionally. There's no, or Hans Zimmer or Howard Shore or any of those of those guys. There are no mistakes. There are no coincidences. And because of that, it's very, very, very effective. So there's a lot, there's a lot to learn there. Yes. And I was actually about to mention a couple of movies by, uh, which sound like by Hans Zimmer. Because Hans Zimmer is, is an, a, a big, uh, change in the way he writes music. If you take the early mo the early movies he, 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 he scored, okay, I don't know, Rain Man or even Gladiator, which is right mid-career, chord progression and melodies have a, have a big importance in there. Then you get, you get to the Dark Knight trilogy and the, the melody gets less and less important. The chords get less and less important and other elements become more and more important. And then you get things like... Um, um, Dunkirk or Dune or um, Interstellar, where honestly, all the chords, uh, there are some chord progression in Interstellar, there are less chord progression in Dune and Dunkirk, but the chord seems to be like an afterthought. They're not that important. The important point is how, how he plays with dynamic and orchestration and how he makes the sound fuller or less uh, or, 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 or sparser and the exact timbre he uses. I mean, there are long stretches in the soundtrack of Dune where it's practically a constant chord or even a constant note, but the timbre is changing and the dynamic is changing and it's very emotional and it still fits the what's on screen. So it's like, of course, I'm not Hans Zimmer. I don't know how he's thinking, but it's like at a certain point, he just got bored of the whole harmony thing and he went like, okay, let's see how far can I go without using a harmony? Because harmony, it's... If you push harmony far enough, before or later you end up in John Williams' territory, okay? <laughs> because he's a, he's a master of harmony. I mean, okay, or you end up in some, somewhere else. But it's like Hans Zimmer went, went, okay, those things have been explored. I'm going to take dynamic and timber for myself. And they did. Okay, uh, Dunkirk, there was a joke post about uh, the soundtrack in Dunkirk. It is one note repeated endlessly, growing from very, very, very pianissimo to very, very, very fortissimo, okay? So from 5P to 5F, okay? Gradually throughout the movie. And it's pretty much that. It just makes it work. I mean, just because I can, I'm not dismissing it. I'm just saying it took something simple and it made it work emotionally with the movie. That's a big accomplishment, okay? There is nothing, the concept per se is not complex. It's just applied really well with a lot of attention to every single scene, what's happening in the scene, what's the intended motion, and then kind of Hans Zimmer sit down and carefully measures everything to get the exact effects he wants from the incredible restriction he put on himself. I mean, if he put a restriction on himself, but sounds that way to me. Okay, so... That's easy because anybody can hear timber and anybody can hear dynamics or volume without having to transcribe anything. You don't have to have a great inter ear for intervals. So watch those movies and see what happens on those elements. <laughs> okay. Great stuff. Awesome. So Tommaso, I believe you have something for people that they can check out of yours and perhaps- yes, Yes, I do. Could you put it on screen for a moment? Thank you very much. Very good. I'm going to move a little bit. Good. 
Hopefully I can do that. Fantastic. So that's a free book. It's completely free. Those are 18 tips to make your pentatonic solo sound professionals. What is that? This is music theory applied to the pentatonic solo. If you like uh, Eric Clapton, Jimi Hendrix, if you like uh, Pink Floyd, if you like uh, all those kind of classic uh, sound of the guitar, okay? If you like the classic sound of the, of the guitar solo, those 18 tips distill the main tricks used in those solos, okay? In a way that you can break apart and put together and make your own solo out of that. So there is definitely this kind of old flavor to it, but you can recombine it to make it very modern. The same tricks are used today by other people like Matteo Mancuso or Matteo Sasato, okay? Which are way more modern players, okay? It's, those are the same tricks, okay? It's, it's a collection, if you want, of the best things you can play on the pentatonic in bite size and with a lot of indication how to make them your own. Okay, and it's completely free. Just like we were doing today, like we were giving examples of how different chords, a different situation, or different movement create different feelings. These contains several examples on how. You can get that sound out of your guitar, the classic sound of the guitar solo out of your guitar. That's what it is. Get it here. It's completely free. No string attached. Very good. Awesome. And I also have something uh, for you guys. And this is something you can download for free right now. It's about putting fire and emotion into everything that you're playing. So you, you guys are all playing guitar, right? And I, my assumption is, is that when you play, you want to play with as much feel as you can. And there are certain things you can do without necessarily changing what you're playing, but by changing how you play them, you can bring out more emotion in the licks or the riffs or the phrases that you're playing. And these are fairly easy things to do. It's not, you know, you don't have to be very advanced to learn these things and apply them into your playing so that you have more fire and emotion in everything that you play. And it makes playing guitar just a lot more fun. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Celio, for all your time and all the, the great stuff that you uh, shared here today. I hope everybody was taking good notes because you shared some really great ways to you know establish beauty, uh, mystery, uh, lament with some of the examples. You talked not only about different harmonic um you know chords and harmony things that you can do but also you talked about pitch range and other things as well uh, we talked about voice leading there was a lot of great stuff if you came in late or you missed it go back and watch it from the beginning you'll be glad that you did there's so much great stuff here thank you for everybody who asked questions and participated take care everybody thank you dr Celio. thank you have a great day everybody